Um, so thank you everyone uh, for joining our talk today. And so I'm Sam Stewart. I'm the criticalist at uh, London Vet Specialists. And today we are going to be talking about feline dyspnea. Yeah, slides here to advance. There we go. Um, so starting off, why, uh, you know, why is it important for us to be talking about uh, feline dyspnea? Um, so there's several reasons. You know, a big one is that sort of the early clinical signs that you can see as these dyspnea ep episodes are starting are not always uh, sort of noticed by owners. So by the time they actually notice and realize that they need to bring them to the hospital, it's often more of an acute emergency because now they're actually way more severely affected as opposed to maybe when they're in those early stages of just starting to have some breathing difficulties. So we tend to see them presenting when they're already at their worst. Um, you know, and a big challenging thing is, you know, how do we stabilize these? What sort of supportive treatments do we do for them? And that's also super important because a lot of the times we have to provide those uh, treatments before we can really investigate what the underlying cause is. So it's a matter of having to be able to, you know, have a limited physical exam, limited diagnostics, make your best sort of presumption of what that diagnosis is, and then start those treatments, you know, sort of without having that confirmation. And I think that probably most of all is what makes most people uncomfortable with this topic. Um, you know, and so just because of that, there is a wide range of comfort levels. And so I'm hoping that, you know, sort of a few things that we touch on through this presentation may be increase your comfort level if you were to have one of these cases present and that way you can kind of know how to work your way through that initial stabilization and then the diagnostics that you'll need. Uh, so in terms of objectives of what we're going to be going through um, in this presentation, so first we'll just talk about the initial sort of recognition of dyspnea and the triage around it, which I think probably most people are fairly uh, familiar with already. Um, the common actual respiratory emergencies that present, uh, some basic pathophys, some targeted uh, physical exam uh, and diagnostics that you can do, initial stabilization treatment, and then long-term management for uh, a few of these. Um, so starting off, this is just a video of you know, a dyspnea cat. Um, I think this is probably something that I imagine most of us should feel pretty comfortable with identifying, but you know, your big things looking at um, open mouth breathing, extension of the neck when trying to inhale, trying to make a more direct pathway down into the lungs, seeing that abdominal component um, as they're breathing, so watching those abdominal muscles contract. So you know, this is a pretty stereotypical classification of what a dyspnea cat would look like. Uh, so when it comes to your physical exam findings for these um, cats, you know, there's going to be certain things on the observation side that are just going to be pretty obvious. You know, are they tachypneic? Are they dyspneic? Uh, do you see nasal discharge? You know, that nasal discharge can be an indication of, you know, really severe heart failure. It could be an indication of some um, underlying uh, uh, pneumonia, and you're seeing some fluid coming up from that. Um, but you can also see things like hemoptysis, so um, fluid coming up with blood in it um, and the open mouth breathing or the extended neck position like we saw in uh, that last video. And so if you're seeing those, those are going to be um, those flash there things that kind of sort of tell you that you need an immediate intervention um, to help that patient. So those are all signs of really compromised breathing that tells you you really have to do something soon to, to help that patient. Oh, when it comes to vitals, you know, these are all pretty much your standard vitals that you're going to take on these patients. You know, temperature is useful looking um, to try to determine if there could be an infectious etiology presence. So, you know, if there was a really bad pneumonia, you would assume that they would have a little bit of a fever. Um, heart rate, you know, if this is going to be a heart failure patient. You tend to see, um, you know, cats are a little bit weird. They either go high or low on their heart rate. So if you have an elevated or a decreased heart rate, um, you know, looking at your mucous membrane color and capillary refill time, you know, if it takes uh, prolonged capillary refill time, it might make you think a little bit more um, towards the realm of heart failure over something like asthma. So again, sort of getting comfortable with your basic vitals and what those could mean um, are definitely helpful if you don't have that opportunity to do diagnostics in some of these cats and you have to make um, you know, some initial stabilization decisions with just your physical exam alone. So trying to figure out how to really fish your way through those and, and make your best guesses. Um, but auscultation obviously is a big component for this. So, um, you know, listening for harsh lung sounds, do you hear crackles? That would be suggestive of fluid, which would be something like pneumonia or heart failure. Or do you hear wheezes, which would make you think more inflammatory, narrowed airways, something that you'd see with asthma. Uh, do you hear a heart murmur? And, you know, one important thing to know is that, um, I forget the exact percentage, but it's roughly 50-50, I believe, of cats that have underlying heart disease that don't have an audible murmur. So just because the murmur is not present doesn't mean that they don't have heart disease. So um, that's some uh, you know, thing not to get caught up on. If, if you're not hearing that murmur, it doesn't mean that it couldn't be a heart failure. 
Um, arrhythmia is the big thing. Um, they actually have shown that uh, cats are more likely to have an underlying arrhythmia when they're impending into heart failure more so than a murmur. Um, and so the big one is going to be a gallop arrhythmia. Um, so if you're not comfortable listening for gallop arrhythmias, I recommend uh, YouTubing a few sound clips and see if you can just sort of get yourself more comfortable with that because that is actually one of the more prognostic ways um, to detect uh, impending heart failure in cats. Um, in addition to that, apps under muffled heart sound. So when cats go into heart failure or heart failure or have some other, um, maybe not pulmonary pathology, but pleural pathology, so something that's causing fluid accumulation in the chest, um, those are going to cause uh, muffled heart sound. So if you don't have you know, immediate access to an ultrasound or that cat isn't stable enough to get x-rays right now, but you um, are questioning if it could have pleural effusion, you know, if you hear you know, super muffled heart sounds or muffled lung sounds, and that's going to be a little bit more support for you to say, you know what, I, I think there's going to be fluid. So in terms of working our way into our diagnostics, we'll first look at our radiographs. And so the big thing with radiographs is, as you can imagine, we are having to hold these patients down. We are having to, um, you know, really restrain them and and hold them in positions that aren't comfortable. And especially, you know, holding them on their back for some of these positions, that's going to challenge their breathing when it's already super challenged. Um, and so that's going to just stress them out and could potentially make some of these patients just go into cardiopulmonary arrest. Um, so generally speaking, it's always stabilized first radiograph second, and that is only if they are stable to do it. Um, so you should never push a radiograph because that's a good way to kill your patient on the x-ray table. Um, now, if the patient is stable enough to get these, you should always shoot for three view x-rays um, for the chest. It's always sort of your gold standard and should always be um, what you aim to get. Um, however, obviously patient stable um, stabilization is going to be the most important thing. So if they are not stable enough to get, you know, full three view rads, you could at least get two views, one of the laterals and either DV or VD, um, that would be good. And then once you have those, really looking through and saying, you know, in the pulmonary parenchyma, do I see evidence of edema? Um, could I see maybe a more ventral uh, distribution, which would make me think pneumonia? Or is there no, um, you know, interstitial pattern? It looks more bronchial, which would make me think asthma. Um, and we're going to go through a few examples of each of these as we go through uh, the presentation here. Um, you, know, you can also look for evidence of infusion on these x-rays, and then you can also look at that heart and get a general, you know, not really looking at the chambers or, um, you know, end of the heart, but you can see general heart size and say, you know, do I think this looks like cardiomegaly that might give me more support for this being heart failure? Uh, so looking at some uh, radiograph examples, this is going to be an example of some pulmonary edema. So seeing that interstitial pattern or that sort of increased opacity here in the cotodorsal lung field, um, most concentrated around your perihilar region, because that's where a lot of your um, primary blood vessels are that are going to come off right after they're uh, leaving the heart. And so that's where you're going to get the most of the fluid, fluid accumulation. Now, with that being said, the pulmonary edema side isn't as common in cats as it is in dogs. Uh, cats tend to more so have the pleural effusion side of their um, heart failure. So they can certainly have both. They can have one or the other. Um, but I do feel like we tend to see more of the pleural effusions um, on the cats with heart failure. And so this is what your typical pleural effusion heart failure uh, radiograph would look like. Uh, so lots of fluid here in the chest, lungs pushed back up into the uh, cotodorsal lung field there. Um, and so that would tell you that there's some sort of pathology obviously causing fluid accumulation. Uh, and then the other kind of third classic um, uh, radiograph finding is going to be your bronchial pattern or um, signs of lower airway inflammatory disease. So looking for our donuts, um, so the little the little donuts in here, the train tracks. Uh, there's a train track right there. I don't know if you guys can see my marker, um, but there's tra you know free train tracks in here. And what those donuts and train tracks are is inflammation in the walls of the bronchioles and the lungs. And so we're actually seeing an inflamed or a thickened bronchial wall, and that's why we can see when it's end on, it looks like a donut, or if you're cutting it in cross section, it looks like train tracks. Um, and so if you can see those, that's telling that there's some form of inflammation developing in those lungs. And I can tell this patient doesn't have a fusion. I don't see pulmonary edema. That looks like a pretty normal heart to me. Um, so I don't have evidence of pneumonia or heart failure, but I do see this bronchial pattern. So that to me would say, I think there's an inflammatory process going on in this cat like asthma. Um, now, in addition to radiographs, uh, for me, a big component of how I work up these patients is with ultrasound. Um, and now not Every practice is going to have ultrasound, but it is out of all of the um, you know, sort of diagnostic uh, machines that you can have in your practice. It's one that I think very strongly that I think everyone at least should have a basic ultrasound unit. I um, mean, you can get them for pretty inexpensively for if you buy a refurbished one um, and it will greatly improve, not even just your dyspneic cats, but all of your other patients. It'll, it'll significantly improve how well you can treat them and, and work them up within your own practice. 
Um, so I did devote a number of slides in this presentation just to how to do um, ultrasound of the chest and not only of the chest, but of the lungs as well. So lung ultrasound is a, sort of a new thing that we're starting to do in vet men. I think there's probably a few people on this uh, this call that have, have done it before and are somewhat familiar with it. But if you're not, um, it's really helpful and it's actually really um, accurate in order to diagnose some of these conditions. So I, I personally think it's super helpful. and It's always my first line of things that I can do um, to work these patients up. Uh, so in terms of using ultrasound, um, it really has become the initial test of choice, and this is both in human and in vet med um, for free fluid, but that list is expanding out beyond free fluid um, to pulmonary edema, pneumothorax, um, uh, pneumonia, and all these other lung pathologies. And what they've shown is that using the stethoscope, I'm sorry, using the um, uh, using the ultrasound over radiographs in a number of these conditions is actually showing to be more sensitive and more specific than just by listening with auscultation or by doing um, so supine, which you know in humans, uh, VD is the equivalent for us, um, it's actually more accurate than doing those radiographs. Um, and so if you can get really comfortable with doing these ultrasound examinations, you actually have sometimes a, a higher chance of being able to come up with a diagnosis than if you were to do x-rays. And so that's a big reason to get more comfortable with this. Um, and so this is a paper from uh, 2008 um, looking at the use of, of this blue or bedside lung ultrasound exam in patients. And so this was a human paper, so not veterinary, but just giving you an idea of the utility of this. Um, and so there's a lot going on in this chart. I really mostly just want everyone to look at sensitivity and specificity, these two uh, columns right here. So sensitivity is basically of the patients that have this disease, um, which of those actually came up positive. And specificity means of the patients that don't have this disease, how many of them came up negative. And so obviously the higher those percentages are, the better that is. And so you can see for cardiogenic pulmonary edema, asthma, uh, pneumothorax, pneumonia, you know, 97, 95, 89, and you know, those are pretty high numbers. So it's surprisingly good at being able to differentiate these things on ultrasound. Um, it gets a little bit more confusing when you get down to pneumonia, you can see 11% versus 100%, but 11% for sensitivity is not great. Um, however, there are you know, certain findings that you can do. So there's several different ways that you can you can look up pneumonia, which is going to be a little bit sort of past the, the spectrum of, of what we're going to go over in this talk. But you can certainly get that pneumonia diagnosis much higher to 89% and 94% if you kind of uh, change the way that you're doing it. But overall, the main picture is just to get that it's, it's surprisingly uh, useful to be able to use the ultrasound for, for working up these patients. Um, and so a lot of you are probably familiar with the term uh, TFAST, a thoracic focused assessment using sonography for trauma that literally is just a, what with the term that we use for doing an ultrasound of the chest, especially on an ER setting of you know, what can I just quickly look at within this chest to make a fast diagnosis and figure out what I need to do for this patient. Um, they, they put out this thing a little while ago, but instead of calling it TFAST, calling it the TFAST 3 because we're, you know, we're not just doing it for trauma because that last T in this is, is for trauma, but we obviously use this for more than just trauma. So it's for trauma, it's for triaging, and then we can also track these patients over time. Um, and so they're, they're throwing that in there as well. So those are the, the three T's that they're, they're now putting into this, which really isn't super important. But um, the other thing is looking at that blue. So like I said, blue is bedside lung ultrasound examination. So to me, this is the big thing that's going to help you work out some of your underlying lung pathologies in these dyspneic cats in a time sensitive manner to figure out what you have to do for treatment. Uh, and then there's something called the global fast exam, which is your T-FAST plus the lung ultrasound plus um, the A-FAST or the abdominal scan, which uh, obviously we're not going to be talking about that in this lecture. Uh, so starting with the TFAST exam, this is a five point scan. So there are five different areas that you are going to perform this uh, ultrasound on the dog. So the first is going to be this CTS site or the chest tube site. So this is the location where you would place a chest tube if you're placing a chest tube. And so this is a bilateral site. It's uh, dorsal, it's around your ninth or 10 rib spaces. And so it'll be both left and right sides. Um, after that, you have your PCS or your pericardial site. Um, so this is a site that you would get your best visualization, visualization of the heart. So it tends to be fourth to fifth rib space more eventually. So about your uh, lower third of the ribs. Um, and again, this will be a left and right side um, uh, location. And then the last one is your uh, DH view, which stands for diaphragmatic hepatic. And so this is actually putting the probe in the abdomen having that probe image through the liver, through the diaphragm, and then looking into the ventral, or I should say the, the caudal aspect of the chest, but from the abdomen. And I'll get to a, a little few slides later as to what we would use that view for. 
Um, but initially, we're going to look at the CTS or the chest tube site first. Um, and so the big thing about the chest tube site is it's a good place to diagnose uh, pneumothorax. So uh, um, having a collapsed lung, you can see that um, in this location, uh, if you have a really severe pleural, uh, sorry, pulmonary, I mean, sorry, pleural fusion, um, you can also see that from this view, if it's bad enough that it's uh, extending up into the dorsal aspect of the chest. Um, but what to look at in this chest tube site? Uh, so like I said, it's gonna be fourth, fifth rib space, your upper third of your chest. Um, and you're looking at this image here in the middle, uh, where you're going to see uh, these two, uh, you know, uh, big sort of vertical structures that are labeled RS, which is stand for rib shadows. So um, you know, you're going to see a bow and it's going to cast a shadow. So you're looking for rib shadows, and then you're going to see these back and forth, left to right lines, which we call A lines. And all that is is air artifact. You know, your lungs are full of air. Ultrasound beams don't penetrate through air, so you're going to get an artifact. And that air artifact looks like these left to right lines, which we're just calling A lines. Um, over here in this image here, you can see uh, on the right, we've got our two ribs and our two rib shadows coming off. And then we can see those back and forth lines, which are the A lines, which are our uh, air artifact, which we expect to see. And those air artifacts are surprisingly helpful in us uh, working out what's going on. Uh, and then here, um, in case you're wondering why this is gator sign, um, this is what we sort of use to describe when you're trying to get the ideal ultrasound positioning when you're doing this scan. And so what you want to do is you want to get yourself centered right in between two rib spaces and have it look like a gator, an alligator poking up out of the water and have their eyes poking out. Um, and so if you can get that image on the CTS site, um, that is your ideal way to be able to assess lung pathology in that region. Uh, so a th big thing we look at um, in the CTS is something called a glide sign. And so looking at this ultrasound image, the top portion, we've got some skin, we have some muscle and some sub -Q tissues here, but then you get this bright white line um, right underneath that. And that is the interface from where your lung comes in contact with your body wall. And so you get a bright white line because that's where your air, artif um, air artifact starts. And then you can see all those A lines coming off below that. Um, but what you're looking for for the glide sign is this gliding motion back and forth. And what we're literally seeing is the edge of that lung as you inhale and exhale gliding against the side of the body wall. And so what that tells me is that this is a fully inflated lung. It is breathing normally. I can literally see it moving back and forth over the body wall. So to me, without have, being able to really look in and see the pathology, I, I believe this is a fairly normal lung because I see it moving and, and sort of respiring normally. It doesn't look like it's dyspneic. It doesn't look tachypneic. Um, but, you know, this glide sign is a, is a pretty important thing to, to notice. And the reason it's an important thing to notice is what we have on this uh, next slide here, where I have two images that pretty much are the same image. Um, however, there is one difference, and that one difference is these arrows here at that initial sort of bright white line at the interface of where your lung meets your body wall. And so the image on the left has the arrows, which is uh, essentially a representation of that glide sign. Uh, the image on the right does not have that arrows, meaning that there is no glide sign. The reason that's important is because on the left side, that's normal, literally what we just talked about. Um, but on the right side, when there is no glide sign, that's how you diagnose a pneumothorax. And so a pneumothorax with that lung being collapsed away from the body wall, it would make sense that we can't see that gliding motion because there is no lung contact with the body wall. That ultrasound beam is going to hit that free air into the chest. You're going to get the exact same air artifact with the air A line. So it looks exactly like a normal patient. The only difference is you don't get the glide sign. And so that is why it's important to be able to look for that glide sign. And that's how you can diagnose a pneumothorax with ultrasound because you cannot see it. Um, and so that's, to me, one of the first things I look at when I do um, a TFAS exam is I look to say, can I see that glide sign and do I think this patient has a pneumothorax? If I uh, don't, or if I do see a glide sign and therefore I don't believe it's a pneumothorax, um, then that's when you start going on to your sort of other presumptions or looking for other signs. Um, but this video here is a good video of what a pneumothorax would look like. We have um, one rib uh, here in our rib shadow. We have the other rib shadow over here on the left coming down. Uh, there is that bright white line of our uh, lung chest wall interface. And you can notice there's you know, there's no, there's a little movement from the probe uh, as the person's holding it, but you don't see this area gliding back and forth. So to me, I'm seeing air artifact. I'm not seeing movement. So that tells me that there is um, not contact with the lung or a pneumothorax. 
Um, not only can you diagnose a pneumothorax with ultrasound, you can also determine how severe it is. So is it sort of a partial pneumothorax like this image here in the middle or a massive or a major pneumothorax like the image on the right? Um, and the way you do this is you start scanning as dorsally as you can. You then go about midway through the uh, through the chest and then uh, and the ventral portion of the chest. Um, and as you go down, the further down you can get without getting a glide sign, the more severe the pneumothorax is because you're going to get that initial collapse up at the top um, and you're going to lose that contact to the body wall. And then as you get lower, you only lose that contact as the pneumothorax gets more severe. Um, so there's a cool video here from this is actually a human, but you can see this is uh, where we should be seeing our glide sign, but we're not seeing anything. And then all of a sudden, boom, this little uh, glidey piece of lung comes in. Um, I think this video will replay here in a second to see it again. Um, but you see no, no glide sign, no glide sign. And then we move further down the chest and all of a sudden we now see this little bit of, um, of gliding lung. So depending on where you were in the chest as you were scanning down to see that point of the lung, that would help you decide, do I consider this to be a partial or a massive or, or full um, pneumothorax? Uh, and so uh, Greg Lisciandro um, is a criticalist who has done pretty much the majority of the research and publications on um, TFAST, AFAST, and uh, lung ultrasound and VetMed. He also has a whole book on it. Um, so great uh, reference sort of to look up if you want to learn more about this. Um, but he did a big study of 145 dogs um, that had trauma and was comparing the ability of using a TFAST to uh, thoracic radiographs. Um, and showed that there was actually a pretty uh, pretty good sensitivity and specificity to pneumothorax diagnosis. So we saw pneumothorax diagnosis was a little bit higher than this before when we were looking at that human chart, um, but also still not terrible um, in the vet world. Um, but this was with all doctors, you know, trained on TFAST as well as doctors that weren't trained on TFAST. And so when they sort of eliminated the doctors that didn't have more advanced training and they looked at only the experienced TFASTers, um, that sensitivity actually went up to 95% and the specificity of 96%. Uh, 6%, um, and it took them all a median time of uh, three minutes to be able to do that exam. Um, and it, I didn't write it in here, but some of them could do it in uh, under 90 seconds. Uh, so if you get really comfortable with this, this is the nice thing about um, doing TFAS and lung ultrasound is that you can literally do this. That patient comes in, and even if they're not overly stable, you can do this in literally you know, a minute or two and have enough to be able to make your initial stabilization diagnostic uh, uh, treatment options. Um, and then, uh, so your chest tube site, like I said before, is really mostly for pneumothorax diagnosis, but if you have a really severe pleural effusion, you will see those in the site as well. Um, and so this is just a video. We have our diaphragm here. You can see our liver, um, lots of fluid, which is the dark black. And then we have a little bit of a, a piece of lung that you can just see floating in that back part. of So one of the caudal lung lobes that you can see floating in that fluid. So again, this will be your more severe pleural effusion cases, but you can see that um, in your pericardial site or your uh, chest tube site. Um, so next we're going to go to the pericardial site. So this is going to be the one that's uh, down uh, ventral fourth, fifth rib space around the heart. And so this is a useful for diagnosing your smaller volume uh, pleural effusions, but also looking for pericardial effusions since we can see the heart. Um, we can also assess the heart itself. So do we see evidence of um, significant structural changes to the heart that would make me think this could be a congestive heart failure? Do I uh, see a normal heart that would tell me that maybe the pleural effusion that I'm seeing is from a non-cardiogenic cause. Uh, and then um, also a big thing that some people don't think to look at is the actual contractility of the heart. Um, and you know, to really measure contractility, you have to do something called fractional shortening, which is, is really a cardiologist thing. And I don't expect any of you to do that. I have no idea how to, how to measure fractional shortening. But if you've looked at enough hearts, you can get a general subjective idea of how hard should they be contracting. And so, you know, without even measuring fractional shortening, you can still look at a heart and say, you know what, I, I can tell that is not contracting like it should. And I think there's decre decreased contractility, and that would tell you that, okay, I, I believe there's some sort of heart disease here, because I can tell we're not contracting normally. Uh, so, first thing looking at this area is going to be pleural, uh, pleural effusion. So, we can see our heart beating over here on the right. Uh, and then we've got a big sort of black pool of fluid right behind that. And then this big sort of funny strand looking thing that's sort of whipping around like a, a lasso in there. Uh, that's going to be some some fibrin strands. Um, one thing that I always find when I see fibrin like that um, is fibrin takes time to develop, especially in these like strands that sort of like fish through and uh, flop around in, in pleural effusion like that. Um, and so when I see a bunch of fiber and that tells me whatever is causing this pleural effusion is a chronic condition, um, meaning that it had to be there long enough to allow that fibrin to develop. 
um, you know, your sort of stereotypical heart failure uh, patients, most of those tend to happen quite acutely, um, and they don't usually have the time for all this fibrin to develop. Um, fibrin also likes to develop in more proteinaceous um, environments, and so heart failure fluid doesn't really tend to be very high in protein. A lot of those have like total solids of zero, um, so you don't tend to see that fibrin. So when I see fibrin in a pleural effusion, it tells me A, likely more chronic, and B, makes me start thinking more on the neoplasia side than heart failure, one of the other things, because you know, those are the conditions that tend to slowly accumulate over time and, and would be more chronic. Uh, pericardial effusion is the other one to look for. Um, it can sometimes be difficult to tell the difference between pericardial and pleural effusion. It sounds kind of silly. You'd think it wouldn't be that difficult, um, but depending on what the severity is, it's not always easy. So the example I have in here is a very severe pericardial effusion, um, but if it wasn't severe, um, you might not be able to tell so easily. Um, but the big thing is always look for the heart, look for this bright white line that surrounds the heart, which is going to be your pericardial sac, and look at what side of that line that fluid is on. Um, and so for this one, you can very obviously tell the fluid is on the inside. Um, not only can I very obviously tell the fluid is on the inside of the pericardial sac, I can tell there's so much fluid that as the heart beats, it is literally making the chambers compress in on themselves. And so that's the condition called tamponade, where you have so much pressure in that pericardial sac that each heartbeat, when that heart relaxes in diastole, you can see both the right and the left uh, ventricles here are collapsing in on themselves because they can't, they can't push against the pressure inside that pericardial sac. Um, so that's pretty severe. Like this dog, or this is a cat. I'm not sure what, what this is a shepherd. It's just, this is a dog. Um, but I know this is a patient that needs that, needs the pericardiocentesis pretty statly um, to get that fluid out of there. Um, now, to me, the biggest reason that you should be comfortable doing TFAS exams is to do quick uh, measurements of the heart. Because if you think this patient might have um, pleural effusion secondary to a congestive heart failure, if you can do a quick measurement of your left atrium and get that left atrial size, that is the best way for you to tell, do I think this is cardiac or do I think this is not cardiac? If I have a normal left atrium, cardiac just doesn't make sense. It, it, you should have in a large left atrium if this is going to be heart failure. And so the best way to, to assess that atrium is getting this exact view right here. Um, which is looking at, uh, you know, look for the Mercedes-Benz symbol um, or the sort of uh, peace sign, which is going to be your atrium. And right below your atrium is going to be your left ventricle. And I'll have some videos of this to make this a little bit easier to see. Uh, but you're looking at that ratio there. And really your um, left atrial to aortic ratio of those diameters should never be more than 1.5. Um, so if you're getting more than 1.5, that's telling you that you have an enlarged left atrium and an underlying cardio, uh, cardiac issue is likely there. Uh, so initially looking at a normal left atrium, um, this should, I think it's going to put labels up on here in a second, but yeah, you have aorta here in the middle, left atrium, like I said, down below. Um, over on the left here is the right atrium, then the right ventricular uh, outflow tract up at the top. But most important, it's going to be that Mercedes-Benz uh, circle in the middle, which is your aorta, and then your left atrium at the bottom. Um, you know, for this one, just looking at it subjectively without even measuring it, I can tell those you know, those are definitely not more than 1.5 difference between the two of them. So I can tell this is a normal heart. Um, and so literally, if I was to put the probe on and I saw this right away, I could just tell you, I don't think this is a heart failure patient. Let's move on and work on to our other diagnostics. Um, it is surprisingly easier than you would think to get this view once you start getting a little bit more comfortable with uh, finding it. So if you're not comfortable with looking for your LAAO, um, just start playing with it, you know, putting ultrasound probes on patients, even if they're normal at that heart, figuring out how you have to twist your probe, how you need to angle your wrist. Um, once you start getting comfortable with it, you can actually do this really fast. Um, so I recommend getting that practice and, and getting comfortable with this for sure. Um, so now this one's going to be a good example of a patient that does have heart disease. So you can see it's be the heart's beating very fast. Again, you would kind of expect that if you're in heart failure, you'd have an elevated heart rate. Um, but you can see we've got our uh, aorta up here. So again, looking for that Mercedes-Benz symbol. And then right below, that's going to be our left atrium. And so, you know, I'm not measuring this, but I would say that we're probably, you know, two to 2.5 times bigger in the left atrium than that aorta. Uh, so clearly there is left atrial enlargement here. And so this cat also had pleural effusion or pulmonary edema. I would feel pretty comfortable saying, yes, I believe quite strongly this is going to be secondary to cardiac disease. Uh, and then lastly, it's going to be poor contractility. Um, so this is just a video of a heart that has, you know, almost non-existent contractility. I mean, you can see the valves moving, but like those walls are barely contracting. And if I go back to the previous slide of the patient that has, um, you know, the really bad atrium, like you can tell, like 
even though this cat has significant heart disease, there's still a contractility there. I go to this next image, I mean, the heart barely moves. Um, so if I saw that, this would tell me that there's really horrible contractility here. Um, and if I saw other uh, symptoms in the lungs or in the pleural space that I believe might be cardiac, this would be supportive of me saying, yes, I, I do believe this is a pretty significant cardiac condition here. Uh, and then lastly, we're going to go over the uh, diaphragmatic hepatic view. And so this is using your um, uh, the liver and the gallbladder to make an acoustic window to look up into the chest. And so the time that this is helpful is if you have one of those cases where you're like, I don't know if this is pleural or pericardial effusion, but I know it's one of them. and I know it's not supposed to be there, but I, I am having a hard time telling which it is. That's where the DHU comes in handy because it can help you differentiate you know, do, is this in the pericardial sac or is this outside of the pericardial sac? Um, and so in this video here, um, you know, at the top of the video, that's our probe. We've got some skin sub Q. There's our liver. There's all gar our uh, gallbladder. We've got our bright white line, which is going to be uh, the diaphragm. And then you can see the heart beating right under that. Uh, and then um, occasionally, it only shows up for a second, but there's going to be a little triangle of fluid just to the left of the heart. Um, and so if you were in your uh, pericardial view and you saw that fluid, and you're like, I don't know if that's uh, pleural pericardial, you'll come to your DH view. And when that triangle pops up over here to the left of the heart, you can say, oh, it's to the left of the heart. It's clearly not in the pericardial sac. That's pleural effusion. Um, or if you saw this heart beating and all that fluid was just in a circle around the heart, you'd say, oh, clearly that's not in the pleural space. That looks like it's pericardial. Um, and so that's where this view will come in handy. Uh, now, that blue or the bed lungs, uh, bedside lung ultrasound exam, um, this is now going to be looking beyond just pleural effusion and pneumothorax and trying to look at literally in the lung for lung pathology. Uh, and so this is going to be an extension of your TFAS exam. It isn't te te technically considered part of TFAS, so it is an extension. Um, but the nice thing about ultrasound for assessing lung pathology is that it is considered better than um, auscultation because environmental noise, other patients sort of barking away in the background won't affect your ability to look with the ultrasound. Um, and if you're experienced in this, it can literally take less than 90 seconds. So if you have those unstable patients, even if you need to literally get them into oxygen or do something to stabilize them, you generally have 60 to 90 seconds to really quickly do this ultrasound. And um, you know, for me, if you know, I have some patients, if I really strongly think they're heart failure, I can pop that probe on, see if they have enlarged left atrium, get them in oxygen with some Lasix, you know, I can do that in even less than 90 seconds if you get comfortable with it. Um, so this is where it comes in handy. Now, with the uh, bedside lung ultrasound exam, uh, there's going to be a total of eight different sites that you check with it, which sounds like a lot. Um, but again, when you get comfortable with it, you, you can generally rapid go through them pretty quickly. But you know, essentially looking at your caudal lung field, your perihilar lung field, middle lung field, and then cranial lung field, and do that on both sides. Uh, and one of the main things you look for with um, with the lung ultrasound is something called lung rockets. Uh, other names for the uh, lung rockets are also bee lines or comet tails. Um, this little video is pretty much what I think about when I think of lung rockets. Um, seems like a silly name, uh, but for some reason that's what someone decided to call them. And what a lung rocket is, is fluid in the lung, which you can see with the ultrasound. And they look like these hyperchoic, so bright white lines that they describe as laser-like streaks um, that go vertically. So we talked about those A-lines before, which look very similar to lung rockets, but those go left to right or horizontally. Um, your actual lung rockets, your B-lines are gonna go up and down. Um, they don't tend to fade as they go into the far fields, um, but they do obliterate the A-lines. So the A-lines that we considered normal, we start losing when we get the B-lines that go up and down through them. Um, as the animal breathes in and out, you'll tend to see a to and fro motion of those B-lines. Um, which again, we're going to I'm going to show you a few videos in a second, so um, this will make more sense in just a couple minutes. Um, one important thing to know though is if you see lung rockets, ULR stands for ultrasound lung rocket. Um, it means that there can't be a pneumothorax. If you can literally see fluid in the lung, that means that lung is in contact with the body wall. So there's no way there could be a pneumothorax if you're able to see fluid in the lung, because if there's a pneumothorax, that would imply the lung was retracted away from the chest. So if you can see a lung rocket, you immediately know this patient's dyspneic, and I can already tell you it's not a pneumothorax. So that's one nice thing about lung rockets. Um, the uh, distribution and the number of those lung rockets also does 
correlate to how severe is the pneumonia. If I see a ton of lung rockets, I know there's a really bad edema there or a really bad pneumonia there. Um, if I only see a few, yes, there's probably still a pathology there, but I know it's not as bad as when I see nothing but lung rockets um, in my ultrasound. Uh, so in terms of what causes lung rockets, it's really anything that can cause fluid accumulation in the lung. So edema, whether it be cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic, pulmonary edema, in which case that would be blood, uh, pneumonia, in which case it would be uh, pus, uh, or pleuritis or pulmonary fibrosis, which is then going to therefore be more inflammatory uh, fluids that you'll see in there. Um, one on one that's not on this list would be like asthma, um, really severe asthma is where you tend to get a little bit of fluid accumulation. Again, nothing anywhere close to like heart failure, but a little bit of fluid, accum fluid accumulation, you can sometimes uh, see those lung rockets as well. Uh, one limitation, which I, I sort of mentioned a little bit on that previous slide, is you do need the pathology to reach the periphery of the lung because once um, you put that probe on the chest, you're only seeing your periphery of the lung. You can't look down deeper into the lung because you hit air and it turns into air artifact. So you only are seeing the peripheral lung with your lung ultrasound, which you think would be limiting. Um, but as you can see in some of those previous research studies, it's actually surprisingly not as limiting as you'd think. Um, however, there will be a subset of patients that only have lung pathology deeper in their lung, meaning you're not gonna see an ultrasound and you're gonna therefore need radiographs or CT or, or some other imaging to find them. Um, so just important to keep in mind when you're when you're doing uh, those those exams. Uh, so these are a few pictures of what lung rockets look like. Um, so we have our rib spaces here. We no longer see our A lines drawn on. We just have these up and down vertical lines. There's the arrow to going back and forth, describing that to and fro motion that they make. Um, on the right is an actual image of what a lung ultrasound looks like. So we have our two rib spaces. We have these up and down bright white lines. Um, probably be better just to go ahead and uh, show you guys a few video examples. Um, and so this is a video of a single lung rocket. Um, so you can see we have a um, rib space directly in the middle of this image. And then just to the left of that, you see that bright white up and down line that kind of comes up and passes back and forth. Um, and so this is what I would call a single lung rocket or a single beeline. Um, now this can be totally normal. If you have a patient that's not dyspneic and you put the probe on them and you see a single beeline, that can be totally normal. You know, there's all sorts of stuff that's floating around in the air that we inhale all the time. You know, our immune system has to get that stuff out of the lungs. And part of that might be a little bit of an inflammatory process to clear that stuff out of your lungs. It might make a little bit of a lung rocket. So there's only a few that's considered normal. Unlike this image where you can see all of your rib spaces, you can tell those up and down lines, but I mean, there's no way you could count how many B lines there are here. There's just so many, they're coalescing together but I can tell that they're there. So to me, this is a patient with severe pulmonary edema, which would also be evidenced by the fact that I can tell how fast they're breathing. Um, sometimes we'll call this the aurora sign because it kind of looks like the aurora borealis because you know, all these lines are coalescing together and just sort of making a, you know, an aurora effect. Um, I had a second image of another one. Um, again, I can tell they're breathing fast. I can tell there's some up and down lines here, but there's so many that they're all just coalescing together and I, I, it's obliterating my ability to see those A lines. Um, and you can just tell that there's a lot of edema in there. Um, now, in terms of the utility of using uh, the lung rockets to uh, diagnose these conditions, um, looking uh, again, Greg Lisciandro, sort of the the person that does all of these um, all of these studies with ultrasound and the lungs, um, showed that of patients that have congestive heart failure, a hundred percent of them um, had lung rockets identified, which is pretty consistent with saying, you know, this is the way we should be really looking at these patients for initial diagnosis. Um, and then looking at patients that did not have respiratory disease, only 11% of them did. And even though it's still 11% of patients without respiratory disease that had lung, rock lung rockets, um, only, um, uh, I think, or I think the majority of those is only like a single lung rocket meeting, you know, that could be totally normal. Um, so just a few examples of doing the uh, lung ultrasound. This is the way you would do it, looking at your four regions on both sides. So if you had four regions that you saw dry, no B lines in any area, you would consider that to be a normal chest. If you had this one, you had B lines or quote unquote wet lungs, but only in the caudo dorsal lung field. Think about what you would presume that to be if this was an X-ray as opposed to an ultrasound. So if you have wet, wet in your caudo dorsal lung field, that would say, okay, I think this might be cardiogenic pulmonary edema because that's where I'm seeing all of that, just so those caudo dorsal lung fields. If everything is looking dry except for, say, you're like your right middle or your more ventral lung lobes, that might say more on the lines of an aspiration pneumonia because everywhere else is dry. 
So starting to get a little idea of how this can help you work your way through these in a really quick manner without having to be so reliant on radiographs. Um, so they do have some recommendations on how to um, use uh, uh, lung ultrasound in your uh, medical records and you know appropriate ways to chart it. So um, you know coming up with a consistent way to always starting caudally, perihilar, middle cranial, sort of always ordering them in that uh, that sense, and then writing left and then writing how many lung rockets you see in in each. So um, you know zero, one, two, three, or or greater than three. I mean you just can't count it. Um, and so this is a great way just to have a standardized way to be documenting this in your medical record. Um, so that was obviously a huge tangent um, on ultrasound, um, but I think it's really important because uh, it, it really is the best way to, to diagnose these patients when they come in. Um, but now I'm going to transition to treatment because I think that's also a big component of what we need to be talking about today. Uh, so first we will talk about our pleural effusions um, and what to do about those. And so really most of your pleural effusions, the main rule is going to be tap it and get that fluid out. And so for thoracocentesis to get that fluid removed, um, I, you know, probably a number of you are fairly comfortable or have done a few of these. Maybe some of you haven't done very many thoracocentesis. Um, they're surprisingly easy. Um, you know, they certainly can be complications that can arise, but, you know, even um, the ones that can arise, they're generally complications that you can deal with and they're pretty hard to actually cause a severe complication. So, um, you know, generally feel comfortable with your ability to do a thoracocentesis. If you have a patient that has a real lot of pleural fusion and is really struggling to breathe, you know, just Go, go for it and get that fluid out of there. Um, you know, it's pretty likely you're going to be just fine to get it out. Um, so I have a list here of, of what I typically use for a thoracocentesis. I have an image on the next slide that I think looks a little bit easier to explain. Um, so I typically will use a butterfly catheter, um, but uh, one thing to keep in mind is that you do have skin, sub-Q tissue, muscle, um, and then your final pleural layer to get through, which, you know, doesn't seem like it would be that thick, but you'd be surprised at how thick all of those layers are. And sometimes a butterfly needle does not penetrate all of those layers. Um, so I see a lot of people that use butterfly needles and they go into the chest and they're like, oh, I'm getting negative pressure. I'm not getting any fluid out. Half the time, they're not even in the chest cavity yet. Um, so if you have a slightly bigger cat or you're just not having excess, uh, success with a butterfly needle or one of your shorter needles, go bigger. Um, I typically always just off the bat, I reach for an inch, uh, you know, inch and a half needle. I just go big. Um, you know, I have more success as long as you're not, you know, jamming it in the chest really hard as far as you can, you know, you're going to be fine. It's, even if you poke along with a needle, you know, most of the needles that we use for thoracocentesis tend to be like a 22 gauge. You know, for workups of a pet that has, say, a lung tumor, we, we do lung FNAs all the time using 22 gauge needles. We don't cause pneumothoraxes just by poking the lung with a 22 gauge needle. So if you accidentally stick that needle in too far and you hit the lung, as long as you don't swing that needle up and down, back and forth, and cause a bunch of lacerations on the lung, you, all you did was make a little poke, it's fine. And you're, you're probably not even going to cause a pneumothorax. Just back out, and, and all should be fine. Um, so don't get afraid about your needle size. Um, but this is my favorite way to set this up. Um, I am the one holding the needle in the chest. I usually have a nurse that is doing the uh, three-way stop valve with the syringe. And then I have that that then just feeds into a one-way system into a, a bucket. Um, always having a couple tubes available to get some samples. Um, you should always have two tube types. Um, I am from the US, so I, I do recognize that these tube uh, colors are different here. Um, so this lavender top here in the US is the EDTA tube, or your, your um, tube that's anticoagulated. And so you should always have one of those tubes available because if there is blood in that chest fluid, um, that blood could potentially um, clot and take out, say there's neoplastic cells, um, it can clot to those cells and make them precipitate out of the solution. Then if you do a cytology, you might not find them. So always have an EDTA tube to get some of those samples. Um, and then this white top tube here is a no additives uh, tube. So there's there's nothing added in that tube. So um, that would just be for your, um, your second sample um, just to have as a backup if your EDTA um, didn't come out good. Um, so when it comes to a thoracocentesis, this is going to pretty much be where we were just looking at that chest tube site for the ultrasound. So seventh to ninth intercostal space. Um, usually you kind of judge where that fluid level is. Um, you know, you won't necessarily go dorsal like you would um, with the ultrasound um, probe. You tend to go a little more eventually because all that fluid is going to fall eventually. Um, Always do a nice uh, sterile prep, sterile glove. Uh, I always clip both sides. You know, there's a chance you might drain from one side because cats tend to have a little bit of a, 
um, a perforated mediastinum. So their the fluid does tend to sort of just shift on both sides. Sometimes you can tap one side and get all the fluid. Um, but I always preemptively shave both in case I don't get it all on one side and I can then go and get the remaining fluid from the other side. I'm always inserting that needle all along the cranial aspect of the rib. If you remember back from anatomy class, all of your veins, arteries, and nerves long run along the caudal aspect of the rib. So if you stick the needle through the caudal aspect, you're going to go through all of those lovely structures. So stay at the cranial aspect of the rib. Um, I always use ultrasound um, to guide my thoracocentesis. I, I don't like doing this without ultrasound. With that being said, if you follow the basic rules about where to stick the needle and you're very confident there's fluid in there, you generally won't have a problem. Um, but if you have ultrasound, it's always better to use that ultrasound to show you where you're putting that needle. Uh, once your needle's in the chest, drain away, um, get all that fluid out, use the ultrasound to follow and see where you're at and, and keep a progress check. Um, if you start getting frank blood and you're no longer just getting kind of what looked like pleural effusion, uh, just stop uh, and and pull your needle either just you know slightly back or pull it out altogether. Um, Sometimes you can hit the heart when you do this. I have hit the heart several times when I've done a thoracocentesis. Um, it is not the end of the world. The heart might have a momentary arrhythmia, but again, same rule as the lung. If you poke it, as long as you don't then start, you know, slashing up and down or back and forth and, you know, causing a laceration on the heart. If you just did an accidental poke, yes, it'll be a little bit annoyed. Uh, it's not the end of the world. The heart will get over it and you'll be fine. Um, so just pull out and start over. Uh, so this is a video, or not a video, this is a picture of uh, someone doing a thoracocentesis. Um, I generally do not take my hand off of the needle um, that's in the chest. So that's one thing I don't love about this picture is that they're not holding that needle. Um, but I would have that on there and I'd have a, a nurse doing the actual um, pulling of the fluid. But roughly so you can just see where to put the, the needle, um, that's a good uh, representation of where to put it. Um, for me, if you go through the effort of, you know, sedating a patient, doing all of this and getting that fluid out, you know, you owe it to that patient to have do at least something with that fluid. Um, to me, the biggest detriment you can ever do to a patient is go through all this effort, remove that fluid, and then just you know, pour it down the drain. You just lost a huge opportunity to sort of work out what could be happening if you don't save that effusion. So if you get the effusion, you do something with it. Uh, you know, if you don't feel comfortable doing some of these things on your own, you know, send it off to a lab and the lab can do it, but there's a ton of stuff that you can do with that fluid in hospital where you can get really fast turnaround time on what could be going on. You know, so looking at the gross appearance, does it look um, hemorrhagic? Does it look chylus? Measuring the total protein, determine if it's a transidate or an exudate, you know, measuring a PCV on it. Do I, you know, do I think it's a, you know, a hemorrhagic? Uh, a fusion. Um, so in the hemorrhagic effusion would be a PCV greater than 10% because inflammatory effusions, you will also see blood in them. But if it's less than 10%, then it doesn't qualify as hemorrhage. It's just sort of blood that sort of entered the, the fluid because of inflammation. Uh, doing a cytology, and you, you know, even if you're not comfortable with cytology, it's really not super hard um, to pick out your obvious things. So always try, you know, looking at yourself, you know, looking at yourself, and that'll get you more comfortable um, doing it and being able to make these diagnoses more quickly on your own. Uh, looking at cell count, you know, are there a ton of red cells, white cells, you know, what's in there with that? Um, and then running it through an actual chemistry analyzer. And so this is going to mostly be for your chylus effusions, looking for triglycerides and cholesterol, um, just to help prove that. Uh, and then obviously there's going to potentially be other diagnostics that you know, will be directed to depending on what you're finding. Uh, and so a nice little array of your possible fluid types that you can get here. So starting off in our transidates, getting a little bit more hemorrhagic, or kind of becoming more proinaceous or almost maybe uh, pus-like, so purulent, and then our very end, which is going to be a very sort of classical uh, chylus effusion. Uh, looking at your uh, total protein and total nucleated cell counts, uh, you, probably a lot of you remember this from vet school um, of seeing this chart, but you know, using your total protein and your, nu your nucleated cell count to determine whether it's a transudate, uh, modified transudate or exudate, and then your sort of different um, uh, differentials that would come with that. Uh, and we're going to go over this a little bit further here in just a second. Uh, but then for the cytology, you know, looking at the background, um, so not looking at any of the cells, but do I see a lot of protein um, on the slide, uh, which would have this sort of just kind of pink staining in the background. So say you can't measure total protein, you can get an idea if it's proteinaceous by looking at the slide. Um, is there bacteria present? And if so, what kind of bacteria? Um, you know, is this, you know, pyothorax, uh, if I can see that bacteria? Um, and really importantly, is it intracellular bacteria, which would really be your confirmation that it's a pyothorax? Uh, and then are there any abnormal cells that might suggest cancer? 
Um, and so this is a picture just of what a proteinaceous background looks like. So, you know, so this one on the left looks pretty white. I don't really see anything on the background, whereas on the right, you've got this pinkish purplish background, and that's going to be that background of protein that's settling on the bottom of the slide that you're seeing here. So if you can't measure total protein, you know, doing a quick diff, uh, diff quick stain on some fluid would be a way to tell you, yes, I believe this is more likely going to be an exudate, even though I can't measure the total protein, I just get that feeling based off of how much protein I can see in the background. Uh, looking for bacteria. So like I said, you, in this picture here, you can see there are some extracellular bacteria, some cocci here in the middle. But then looking at a few of these neutrophils, you can see those cocci inside of the neutrophil as well. And it's really those intracellular cocci that's going to be your confirmation of a pyothorax. Um, if you have the ability to do a gram stain, so this previous slide was at the diff quick stain, which is um, really sufficient for looking for bacteria. But if you want to be super certain and you have the ability to do a gram stain, um, you can do the gram stains because that'll make your white cells look pink and your bacteria generally look uh, dark purple. So it's much easier to see them. Um, so if you don't have confidence you do a gram stain, always go for that. Uh, looking for neoplastic cells. So this is a, a nice example of some really uh, large abnormal looking lymphocytes. So you can see a size of a red blood cell right next to it and then these huge lymphocytes next to them. Um, if you see that, you can feel pretty comfortable if this is likely going to be a lymphoma. Um, this is a cat case that I actually had a few years ago. These are carcinoma cells. So if you start seeing abnormal cells with really big nuclei and you don't know what they are and they're all literally clustering together and adhering to each other, that's highly suspicious for cancer. So that, you know, this cat I knew, you know, after, right after I did this, before I even got my results back from the lab, I knew this was going to be a carcinoma. So if you can see things like that, uh, that is a great way uh, to start working your way through this. Um, but one thing you have to be really careful of is that you have mesothelial cells in your uh, thorax, and those mesothelial cells will get very irritated and reactive when there's pleural effusion there, and they will shut off into the effusion. And reactive mesothelial cells um, look very similar to cancerous cells. Um, and so the arrows in this are pointing to cancerous cells, which are, I think, mostly carcinoma cells. Um, but looking at them next to your um, cells that are the mesothelial ones that, that don't have arrows pointing, you can see they they all kind of look neoplastic. Um, so you do have to be careful. So I personally don't like to just make a definitive call on cancer just off of my cytology skills alone. I generally will always submit it to the lab and I'll tell the owner my inclination ahead of time. But I, I do try to be careful knowing that because I've, I've misclassified mesothelial cells before as cancer. So you do have to use caution when, when doing that. Um, all right, so we have like eight minutes left. I do have a few case examples in here just to kind of go through, you know, all the stuff I just talked about and how I'd use it on a case. So I think I've got three case examples. I'll see how many I can get through in the now seven minutes I have remaining. Um, but uh, you know, this first cat here, 12 year old, male castrated domestic short hair, acute onset of dyspnea, uh, maybe hiding a little bit more, but you know, real significant medical history. Um, this is going just to be a little video of what this cat looked like. You know, you can tell obviously dyspneic, open mouth breathing, extended neck, abdominal effort. Uh, for some reason, lots of people standing around not doing anything about it. Um, you know, one thing with these cats, so something I didn't really stress much in this presentation to this point is if you ever have a cat that looks just really bad and, you know, say you knew it was heart failure and you said, I think this cat's, I, I don't think this cat will be alive long enough for me to get Lasix into it, for that Lasix to work and to make this cat get better. I think this cat's going to not live long enough for that Lasix to take effect. If you ever have a patient that is that severe with their breathing, just sedate them and intubate them. You know, there's really not much negative consequence to intubating a patient, and all it does is give you way more control over their breathing. You can give them much stronger positive pressure ventilation they can do on their own, and you will be surprised at how much more stable these patients are being intubated um, and for you breathing for them. And it also buys you more time to get through your diagnostics and figure out what to do and what's going on. Um, a lot of people are very uncomfortable doing that, but that's something I encourage everyone to be comfortable with. If you have a patient that is really bad with their breathing, just sedate them and intubate them. And you know they might only need it for an hour and then you can extubate them. Um, but don't have them die just because you sort of weren't comfortable just making that call to intubate them. So if you think it's needed, just do it. You can always extubate them later. Um, so for this case example here, you know, a cat has a fairly normal temperature, 36.8, uh, does have a slightly high heart rate, 250, high rest rate, uh, moderate pulses. It does have some hemoptysis. So again, that might be a little bit of a clue here as to what's going on. Um, you can't hear the heart or the ventral lung sounds. Again, another clue. Um, and then some increased BVs or bronchovesicular sounds dorsally, so just some uh, increased lung sounds. Uh, on your TFAST exam, I can tell that this is the chest tube site. 
because I can see some liver, I can see diaphragm, and then I can see a lot of fluid next to that. So I already know now this cat has some pleural effusion. So based off of my physical exam findings and the diagnosis of pleural effusion, I'm going to start kind of making some differentials into my head. Um, and then I say, what's next, you know, with some of these differentials that I start thinking about. So I clearly need to stabilize this cat because that cat was not breathing well. Um, I am worried about cardiopulmonary arrest, so I need to be very careful about how many diagnostics I try to do. Um, I know there's fusion in there, so I know that I need to do a thoracocentesis. And so if I can do that now, I'm going to do it now. If I can't do that thoracocentesis right now, I'm going to give that patient a two meg per keg dose of, uh, sorry, Lasix is the U.S. term for furosemide. So this is a, a two meg per keg dose of furosemide. Um, and then I'm going to place that patient in, in oxygen. Even if this might not be heart failure, it's very rare that a two meg per keg dose of furosemide is going to hurt a patient. So even if this patient turns out to not have heart failure, it's not going to be a huge deal. If you're not sure and you say this patient's not stable enough for me to do anything else, just give them the Lasix, get them into oxygen, get them a little bit more stable, and continue your diagnostics. It's never wrong to give a dose of Lasix, uh, a dose of furosemide. Um, and then finally, if needed, giving them some sedation. So I tend to always reach for butorphanol first. It's got your low um, potential for cardiovasc uh, cardiovascular and respiratory side effects. Um, and so it tends to work well to take that edge off. Um, you can also use midazolam. I always am a little cautious with, with midazolam in cats because it does tend to make them a little bit wiggy and make them a little bit uh, kind of uh, head uh, crazy. But if you need to, it will work a little bit stronger than your butorphanol. Uh, so in this case example, we removed uh, 75 mils from the left chest, 50 mils from the right chest. Uh, looks like a pretty clear watery type of fluid. Total protein is zero, so I know it's a transidate. Uh, we did a quick cytology, and it's really acellular, maybe a crenated red blood cell here or there. No white cells, no bacteria, nothing that looks neoplastic, pretty boring. So in terms of differentials, I'm going to think heart failure, maybe a hypoalbuminemia where we're just getting um, uh, sort of loss of fluid because it's not being held into the vasculature with that low albumin, um, or is there fluid overload, which, you know, this cat just presented to the hospital. It wasn't on IV fluid, so we can already take that one off the list. But if this was a hospitalized cat, obviously that would be another uh, differential. Um, so for this cat, his breathing is a little bit better after that thoracocentesis, but he is still a little bit tachypneic. Um, so you say, well, I know there was fluid there. I still have these differentials. I don't know what it is. So I'm going to re-escult now that fluid is there and I don't have the muffled sounds anymore. I can do a uh, repeat TFAST exam to better look at that heart and look for physical pathology. Um, I bet he's now stable enough for chest rads. I can measure, uh, you know, do a chemistry to look at the albumin, determine if it's hypoalbuminemia. Um, and overall, I know that he's still not in a normal state and I need to be careful not to stress him. Uh, so we got our biochem back, albumin is normal, 3.1. Uh, we escolted him, we can hear all of our lung sounds now, and I don't hear a murmur, which again doesn't take out the possibility of heart failure, but I do hear a gallop rhythm, which should ring some bells. Um, and we still hear increased lung sounds bilaterally. Uh, we were able to get our three view chest rads, which look like this. Uh, we don't see any pulmonary edema, which again isn't always all that classic in cats. Uh, clearly, we did one hell of a job at getting that pleural effusion drained because it's all gone. Um, and what I can see now is that there is a, a generalized cardiomegaly here. I can't see in the heart to see what the structures internally are, but I can tell that is an enlarged heart. Um, so what I do now, I, I have a pretty strong level of suspicion that this is a heart failure cat. So I'm going to now place an IV catheter, assuming that he is stable enough. However, I will not be starting any IV fluids because that's the whole reason this cat is in failure in the first place is that it is uh, intravascularly overloaded. Um, I will keep him in the oxygen cage until he's breathing better, continuing our Lasix slash furosemide at that two meg per keg dose, Q6 to Q8. Um, you can sometimes push that to Q4 if you're thinking you're needing a slightly more frequent dose. Um, however, if you really think that, pa that patient is bad um, and you're thinking about having to move that Lasix to more than Q6, that should sort of just say, maybe I just need to do this as a CRI and not rely on intermittent injections. And to me, I personally prefer CRIs. Um, I think they work better you get more of reliable penetration to the kidneys um, and you're not giving these big bolus doses that sort of overwhelm the kidneys. Um, and so for me, my, my CRI dose for cats is 0.25 to 0.5 mix per keg per hour. Uh, and then finally sedation as needed. Um, one thing I don't have on the slide, which is sort of a new thing that's coming out in the literature is if you ever have a severe heart failure, again, where you're questioning if like maybe you're having to be intubating them big thing about heart failure patients is that their hearts are not contracting normally and you're not getting good cardiac output. So your perfusion around your body is really bad. 
Um, if you're giving a dose of furosemide into a peripheral vein through a leg and you have really poor perfusion, you have to remember your body is going to preferentialize perfusion to your core, and it's not going to be pushing blood either out or back from your legs. So if you have a patient that's not perfusing and you just gave a bolus of furosemide in the leg, there's a good chance that furosemide is going to continue to sit in the leg and not go anywhere. And we needed to get to the kidneys because that's how it works. Um, so if it's not getting there, um, one thing you can do is give a one mil per kg bolus of hypertonic saline. Sounds really counterintuitive because we're now giving them fluids and you're not supposed to give a heart failure patient fluids. Um, but what it does is it um, will help technically, it acts just like mannitol or one of those other hypertonic solutions. It will pull some fluid out of the lungs. Um, but what it does is it momentarily increases your intravascular volume to help get that Lasix or that furosemide out of the leg and to the kidneys. And once that furosemide reaches the kidneys, it kicks into work, puts the kidneys into hyperdrive, gets that fluid drained out of there, um, and they start breathing. So that momentary sort of, oops, I gave fluids, is very quickly corrected by the fact that Lasix then gets to the kidneys and gets that fluid out. Um, so something to keep in the back of your hopper if you ever um, have that situation arise. Uh, and then long-term management for this cat, you know, they're usually in the hospital for one or two days. We watch the respirations closely, get them out of oxygen when they're breathing better, um, switch them to orally six, and then stress the importance of following up with the cardiologist to make sure they get an official echo um, and started on any other medications that they need. Um, I typically don't start cats on pemobendin right off the bat if they are in heart failure because you need to look for left ventricular outflow tract obstructions, which really should be done by a cardiologist. So I mostly just stick with Lasix until they can see the cardiologist and add on additional medications after that. Um, and then this is just an after picture of what he looked like when he was all better and breathing normally. Um, I do have a, I have the other two case examples, which I will, I, I'll just keep going and I'll, um, I'll go through those, but in case there's anyone that wants to jump off, I will pause for a quick second in case anyone has any questions that they want to ask before they jump off. And if there's no questions and anyone wants to stay on, um, I will just plow through these last two case examples real quick. I'm just finish them off, but I'll pause right now for a quick second to see if anyone has any questions. Okay, cool. Um, so we're gonna go through these last two cases really quick. This should only take probably another five minutes. Um, so first case here, we have a nine-year-old female spade domestic short hair with a progressive history of some tachypnea over the last four to five days and otherwise no previous medical history. Um, this is what they look like on presentation. So not overly tachypnic, but clearly dyspneic. You can see the abdominal component, maybe not quite as bad as the last cat. Uh, temperature, not terrible. Um, borderline getting elevated. A heart rate, fairly normal for a stress cat in the hospital. We already know they were tachypnic. Pulses seemed fairly normal. Lung sounds were uh, muffled or unable to be heard. And then on the dorsal aspect, we could hear some harsh lung sounds. Uh, on TFAS exam, we can see our heart beating here in the middle. We can see some fluid over here down off to the left. So I can say there is a pleural effusion, just like our previous case. And so that tells us we need to look at stabilizing this cat. This one's not as critical as that last one. So maybe we're not in the need of those like quite emergent immediate treatments but we know it needs a thoracocentesis. I don't know if this is heart failure or not. So while I'm waiting to get all my thoracocentesis supplies together, I'm gonna give that two make per kg, two make per kg dose of furosemide because I know it's not gonna hurt. And I'm gonna get this cat into oxygen while we wait. We'll then perform our thoracocentesis. Uh, both sides total, we got 150 mils off. This looks kind of like a serosanguinous fluid with a uh, slightly elevated total protein of 3.2. So that's going to be a um, exudate. Um, so that's going to make me think neoplasia, maybe congestive heart failure. You can get those to be exudated if they're not a guaranteed transidate, so it could still be that. Um, or maybe something like an infection. You know, this fluid doesn't look like pus or purulent, but doesn't have to. It could still be infectious. Uh, so do a cytology. Um, this image might look a little bit similar because it's the same one I used on the earlier slide, so kind of giving it away. But, you know, looking at, again, these big, large, abnormal lymphocytes. Um, so I would preemptively call us a, a lymphoma. That's what I would tell the owner while I sent that cytology off uh, for official uh, reading at the lab. Um, we do a right lateral um, x-ray once we got that fluid off. Once again, we did a really good job of getting the fluid off because this is totally dry. Um, and you might not immediately pick up on what is abnormal in this uh, radiograph, but if you look in the cranial chest, there is a lot of opacity here in this cranial chest. So this is actually a cat with a cranial mediastinal mass, which would fit with us finding the um, lymphoma cells in there. So this is a cat with cranial mediastinal lymphoma. 
Um, so again, submit that cytology for official review, um, maybe doing some other further tests just to confirm it. So immunophenotyping or PAR, if you want to uh, get your designation of lymphoma. Uh, uh, then uh, you need to get more imaging if this owner might do uh, more, and they might be pursuing chemo or might need to be getting an actual sample of the primary mass. Uh, you know, doing a CT, uh, FNAs of it, doing ultrasound um, to look uh, for staging, looking to see if it's in the liver or the spleen, um, and then admitting this cat for supportive care, getting them stable, recommending to see an, uh, an oncologist, and if they're not going to see an oncologist and doing chemo, then especially if it's a lymphoma, getting them started on some prednisolone. Um, I usually do 0 0.5 mix per kg Q12, um, but some people do like to do slightly higher doses uh, depending on preference. Um, so for this cat, the official cytology came back as lymphoma. The owner selected not to do anything further, including chemo. So we did start prednis uh, prednisolone. Um, this cat came back two times after that for a repeat thoracocentesis because the fluid really accumulated. Um, and then finally at that second uh, thoracocentesis, the owners decided not to proceed any further and the cat was euthanized uh, a total of two months later. Uh, final case, quickly run through, uh, three-year-old uh, male castrated domestic short hair with some progressive dyspnea, otherwise no previous medical history. Uh, this is what he looks like, so kind of looks dyspneic, also looks like he's maybe doing some coughing slash sneezing, um, but not quite like those other cats were. Um, he has a slightly higher uh, temperature, so borderline getting elevated, heart rate not terrible, respirate high, um, pulse is fine harsh lung sounds, and also you can hear that he is wheezing and having these intermittent coughing. You do your TFAST exam. Um, you can see that there is a glide sign, which um, this unfortunately is a glide sign of a patient that wasn't tachypneic, so it's not moving as fast as I would like it to, but you can still tell that there is that glide happening there, so I can tell it's not a pneumothorax. Um, but I can also tell there's no effusion, so this is different than the other two cases, so now what do we need to do? You know, he's still clearly affected, so we need to we need to look at stabilizing him. But I would start leaning towards an inflammatory process in this cat, so I would be looking at giving a dose of a steroid. So either uh, prednisone acetate, which uh, you know not a lot of hospitals carry this; it's the injectable version of prednisone, um, or dexamethasone, which is what most people have. So giving a dose of dexamethasone. Um, it's also great to give these guys a bronchodilator. So whether you do that injectably with tributylene or inhaled with albuterol, um, and then placing them in oxygen, um, getting them to calm down, and sedating them if needed. Uh, once you're able to get in your x-rays, so I can see a pretty diffuse bronchial pattern in this cat, lots of uh, donuts, lots of uh, train track. And then once you have that, uh, looking to do uh, continued treatment for that patient, so if they're stable, uh, getting them home, if they're not stable, admitting them, getting them on an, inhor an inhaled steroid. Generally, those inhaled, inhaled steroids take a couple weeks to really get take full effect, um, so we'll continue them on an um, oral steroid for those first couple of weeks while they're adapting to the inhaled steroid. Um, also getting them on a bronchodilator, whether that be an oral bronchodilator like theophylline or an inhaled as needed bronchodilator like albuterol. Um, doing further diagnostics, so a BAL if you want to you know, get a lung sample and actually confirm that there's inflammatory cells, which would be your gold standard for confirming pneumonia, um, testing them for heartworm, doing a Bayerman or another test uh, for lungworm. If the owner declines doing any of those further workups, then just starting them on sort of the silver bullet, you know, all of the above, which would be your uh, steroid, um, both inhaled and oral, as well as a bronchodilator, and then to cover your potential for the other things that we did not test for, doxycycline for an underlying, say, pneumonia or other infectious process, and then panicure um, for the lungworm potential. Um, if they are game to do a further workup, then referring to an internal medicine specialist so they can do that uh, BAL to get those lung samples and everything they need uh, to finish that workup. Uh, so for this cat, the owner declined any, any further workup, so we just went with the presumptive diagnosis of regular um, asthma. Um, so this cat was started on fluticasone inhaler, which is um, uh, your standard uh, inhaled steroid for these cats. Um, I didn't write it on here, but the cat was on a, a two-week course of prednisolone um, while it was adapting to the um, fluticasone. Um, giving them an albuterol inhaler to use as needed, um, starting doxycycline for any potential uh, pneumonia or other underlying infectious etiologies, panicure for nine days, which again, you know, to me, nine to 12 days is the course of panicure you need for lungworm, so go longer than what you would typically do. Um, and this cat responded very well and has just stayed on his uh, uh, inhaler long term without any major issues. Uh, so that is the end. Um, hopefully I didn't uh, keep everyone too long, but um, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. 
um, I will hang out for a little while to uh, take those. Otherwise, um, I am at a London Vet Specialist every Friday. So if you have any questions or need any help any cases, feel free to give me a call. Um, but again, thank you for joining and uh, I hope this was useful for you guys. So thanks again. Hi, John. Thank you very much. And um, I do have a question for you. Sure. Um, so I saw a kitten, a kitten, I guess not, that, not that long ago with a pyothorax. Um, I work now um, for a charity, so we are quite restricted of what we have and what we can do. Um, so I managed to drain enough fluids to do a cytology and get the diagnosis, um, but I, then I couldn't properly drain. Um, so I was just wondering if you have any recommendations for those um, pyothorax that you want to kind of drain as much and maybe right. try to do flash of the thorax, but with, in case you don't have a chest tube like me. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And those those pyothorax cases can be a pain sometimes because that you know, that is part of it. I mean, for me, you know, obviously I, I see the patients where I can place a chest tube and, and do all of that. But for someone in your situation, that's not always not always doable. Um, and so when you were trying to get, was it was it the 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 um, the, the pus was it was it just too thick that you could not spray? Yeah. Was that the okay? Yeah, it was getting a stuck. Yeah. So sometimes what I've done for those is you can place you know not a true um, you know. Uh, uh, chest tube where you can just use like a, an IV catheter because mm -hmm. um, some people use an IV catheter to drain a chest. You use the IV catheter, get it in, drain what you can, and then you can do uh, some lavage with that. So it should be a warm saline uh, fluid, you know, like five, ten, five to 10 mils per keg, um, you know, slowly inject it, kind of slosh the cat around a little bit, which sounds kind of silly. Um, and then that'll help start breaking up some of that. It'll start breaking through some of the fiber that's maybe cavitating that uh, that pus in the chest and then you can start getting a little bit maybe more um, success at draining it out um, and so that's something that we've done we don't have like regular chest tubes you get it drained out um, and then you obviously get them started on some really good broad spectrum antibiotics it, you know, there's a pretty strong chance that cat is going to refill um, with fluid and, and pus so it's mm -hmm. it's annoying because you're going to have to do that several times sometimes if the owners aren't able to you know, admit them to the hospital or, or keep them there that's where you start getting into those challenging circumstances where you're like well I'm I, and how much longer can I do this for um, but that's that's pretty much sort of what you have the option to do in that scenario is you know you do the lavage with an you know not a, a gold standard chest tube you, know, you just sort of prep the owner it's going to have to be done multiple times um, and then even with all of that, there are those cats that just aren't going to respond to that approach. Even if you had a full gold standard chest tube in, there's some cats that still just don't respond and they won't respond without a surgery like a thoracotomy to really go in and you know, remove whatever the inciting cause is. But in your scenario, it would literally just be a IV catheter, lavaging intermittently, draining, and hoping at some point with your IV antibiotic approach that you'll, you'll start getting um, you know, decreased volumes over time that, that will show you that they're responding.